One of the biggest things that people always struggle with when they're looking to get into real estate is how in the world am I going to raise all this money? And I think that's one of the biggest things that keeps people back from actually getting started. And today we're going to show you how you can get started in real estate without any money and without having to raise any money. Sounds good, right? Let's get to it. Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor. I am Kyle Stanley, and we are talking today with the head of the Investor Creator Podcast, Brad Smotherman. He is talking all about how to take over properties, cash flow, and get um, even better fees than wholesalers are getting sometimes without having to put any money in deals. I know you're probably wondering how in the world he's doing that. We've already talked a little bit about this on other podcasts, but I really like how Brad just really simplifies things, shares exactly how he's gone from deal one all the way to the hundreds of deals that he's done over the few years that he's been doing this. A few years, I mean, more like 12 to 15 years that he's been doing this. Uh, but Brad today is talking exactly about how we can do that. Before we jump into it with Brad, I want to encourage you, go to fearlesskyle.com forward slash consultation. If you want to learn more about what exit strategy you want to get into with real estate, is it Airbnb? Is it creative financing? Is it flipping? Is it wholesaling? So many people right now know they want to get into real estate. They feel something is coming here with this whole coronavirus and they're wondering what in the world should I do to get into real estate? And I want to help pave that path for you, or I just want to answer any questions for you. So it's absolutely free, 15 minutes. You can get on there with me. Again, it's fearlesskyle.com forward slash consultation, and we can jump on a quick 15-minute phone call. Now, let's get to it with Brad Smotherman talking about creative financing and how to get into real estate deals with no money at all. Hey, welcome into another episode of The Fearless Investor. You're here with me, Kyle Stanley, and Brad Smotherman, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Brad, thanks for being with us today. Kyle, appreciate you having me. Awesome. Okay, so Brad, uh, most interesting real estate investing story. Hit us with it. Well, it, it's, it's a tough one between uh, a poor girl getting raped in one of my houses, okay. uh, an arson investigation on a second one, and then, but I, I think the one that uh, kind of hits home the most right now. We had a transaction in Georgia, based out of Tennessee. We had a transaction in Georgia where we bought a property, we got 0% rate owner financing on that deal and gave the person a $30,000 down payment. Well, about 30 days after we closed, uh, we got a call from the seller saying, hey, uh, there's someone in my house and, and all this. And I was thinking, this is kind of weird, but long story short, she told us that she did not indeed sell us the house, that it was an imposter, that we had frauded her, that we had sexually assaulted her and stolen $750,000 worth of antique cars from the property. Wow. Now, there was no garage on the property. So I, I'm guessing if there were $750,000 worth of antique mint condition cars that they were out in the field. So I'm not sure. But what we ended up finding out was that she took the $30,000 down payment and, and had done like 30 days of meth oh. and had just completely gone halfway crazy. Um, she ended up apologizing after the fact and, and saying that, you know, we hadn't done nothing wrong. And so, uh, but I've never, she, she actually called the, the, the news uh, on us and, and I thought it was going to be published. It ended up, it wasn't, but uh, I've just never had a situation happen where we bought a property and the seller said that we had not bought the property. Everything's notarized. And I'm thinking like, this is something out of the twilight zone, man. It, it was one for the record books for sure. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, I guess at the end of the day, at least uh, it all came to, so you, you guys did end up getting the property. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. I mean, we, okay. we bought it. We had title insur insurance when we bought it and I was yeah. thinking this is good. But uh, the attorney that we closed with in Georgia, because Georgia is an attorney state said that this would be the third time in his career that someone came in. If it had indeed happened this way, that it would have been the third time in his career that somebody came in with a forged uh, driver's license for him to notarize. And he was like, it would fall under my errors and omissions. But it was like, yeah, I've seen this happen before. So we didn't know really if we had the right seller or not. Oh my so gosh. it was a crazy thing. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wild. Well, Hey, that's, that's a great start into our show here today. I'm excited to get to know you, Brad, excited to really, especially right now with everything that's going on, the uncertainty of the market, you have a great, great way um, that is helping uh, homeowners, that's helping your business, and is also helping other people to be able to learn how to flip houses with less risk. I think that's the big thing right now is risk is scary. But before 
uh, we get into all that, I want to know where Brad came from. What brought you into real estate? What were you doing before? Kind of catch us up. Yeah, well, I don't know if I was doing much before because I was so young when I got into real estate in the first place. So uh, I woke up one morning and I don't know what how this happened. I always enjoyed watching the Carlton Sheets videos on late night TV because I thought, man, like here's some people like the whole rags to riches story, even as a uh, a young teenager, I enjoyed that story, but I woke up one morning when I was 17 and decided to get my real estate license. So uh, I got my license between high school and college, started college. Uh, my first six months of selling real estate, I made a total of $1,800 and I have my 1099 to prove it. I just found it the other day and I thought that was kind of fun. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I was a dismal failure when I first started. I mean, it's a yeah. tough thing to, to do. Uh, I got picked up by a builder developer from my church. I sold new construction and development from 2006 until basically the crash. And what I saw in the crash was that people that had long-term assets and cash flow assets weathered that storm better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so I decided in 2010 to retire my real estate license and get into the investing game, having never bought an investment property before. So I decided to burn the bridges, burn the ships, like let's commit to the investing business. And that was 2010. And, and about eight months later, it took me eight months, but eight months later, I, I had my first transaction. That's awesome. Okay. So this was back in, so you started in real estate right around the crash. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, I got my license in 05 and okay. then I started the investing business in 2010. Okay. So what was that like? I mean, you know, when someone gets into real estate, you feel like whether it's investing or as a realtor, it's kind of the same space. But for you, it sounds like there was something that clicked from real estate agent to real estate investor. What was it that clicked that worked better for you? Well, it was a couple of things. So I'm really good at seeing what other people do and their good choices and their bad choices and learning from that. And so um, I saw a couple of things. So number one, when I was working for the builder developer that I sold his new construction, um, I saw that he was basically an investor, a pretty active investor when you're home building, but he was an investor, but he had money, he had, he had a good lifestyle. And I thought, well, that's a lot better than doing the sales side. And I, because in, 20, in, in 2009, I saw the same real estate agents that were making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year in 2004, five, and six, mm -hmm. go back into their office and really begin to grind again. There were cold calling by owners, expired listings and all that. And there's nothing wrong with that because you got to start somewhere. But I didn't want to be in my 50s and 60s doing that. Mm -hmm. But I saw the people that at the point that I saw this, the people that had rental income, uh, which I thought was what I was interested in at the time um, and ended up not being. But those are the people that I saw that weathered that storm. So I thought, gosh, I've got to get out of the sales side and become an owner. Like there's more money in owning real estate than selling real estate. I, ha I had to become an owner. That's awesome. Okay. And you said you had a, how many deals after having that light bulb moment? Well, from then until now, I have no idea. But um, it took me eight months to hit my first deal because, okay. I mean, I was really shoestringing it. I, I didn't have a marketing budget. I, there's a learning curve and I didn't know what I was doing. And so it took me eight months to hit my first deal. But once I got that deal closed and I had some confidence and a little bit of money to market with, we closed three more uh, between August and end of that year. And so we really began to snowball it. Then it kind of becomes you buy a couple of months and then a, one a week and then a couple of weeks. And then at that point, you kind of start moving to different states, different markets. And, you know, it just, it kind of just naturally happens. So that, that's kind of how it happened for me. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing, right? It's that the first deal is always the toughest to get. What was so Absolutely. tough for you um, about getting that deal? And then when you had it, um, you know, just kind of walk us through what that deal looked like. Yeah, so I still remember when the lead came in. Because, you know, guys, in 2010, like the real estate investing market was a really difficult market to play in. So wholesaling all but did not exist because nobody really had equity positions to sell to a wholesaler. Um, fix and flips were really difficult because uh, at the time, if you went to exit on a property because we were in a declining market, you may think that your property was worth 250 but really it was worth two, 230 And by the time you realized you, that it really should have been 230 it was worth 220. So it's kind of like, like a, a snowball going, chasing a snowball downhill. It's pretty yeah. tough, you know? And so, um, but my first deal, I remember I was sitting in my truck. Uh, it was August of 2010. I was sitting in my truck. It was a really hot day. Gas was $4 a gallon. I, I barely had money to pay for gas. And um, the lead came in and I was just so tired of talking to sellers because it was a tough market. You would put bandit signs out or any kind of marketing and have tons of calls, but nobody had equity. 
And so that was the, the problem that you had. And so I remember listening to the voicemail and thinking, I just don't want to call anybody back. Like mm. I just, just, I was exhausted from it, yeah. but I was like, okay. And, and guys, one thing I want to say is most of your big wins are going to come after you want to quit. And, and so I've seen this a few times in my, in my career. It's like, whenever you're just beat up and you, you just feel like there's no chance of winning anymore, like you have to keep going. And that's what this situation was for me. And I was like, well, Brad, you wanted this life. Like you are pressure washing houses right now, part-time with a college degree to go and chase this real estate dream. And so I called the guy back. It was a divorce situation. They were about to be two payments behind. And so long story short, I ended up buying the property subject to a $97,000 mortgage. Uh, that means I didn't qualify for the loan. I didn't assume the loan, but we were just going to take over payments. And I sold it in three days at 140 with 20K down. So basically, I got $20,000 in cash from the transaction. I got a $23,000 note from the transaction that threw off about $400 per month until they paid me off. And so that was my first transaction and, and really allowed me the confidence to move forward and, and a little bit of marketing money. But that was the best thing about that deal. So I'm often asked, well, what's your best deal in your career? It was definitely that one. Because I could then have the confidence to say, yes, I am an investor. I do this professionally and go and do more transactions. That's awesome. Okay, so let's, let's break that down because I think it, really that's what we want to talk about today, right? Is getting these properties with creative terms, creative financing, um, and you just mentioned subject to. So let's pause for a second. What is subject to? Define that for our audience. Okay, great. So subject to is when we have a transfer of title without paying off some kind of lien position. And so that lien position could, it's most often a mortgage, but sometimes it's a judgment. It could be an IRS lien or any kind of a tax lien. And so what we're doing is we're taking a title subject to that lien. And so the question that I'm often, that I often get is, well, don't you have a clouded title? Well, yes, you do, but you have a clouded title anytime that there's a lien, like if you go and get a, a, a bank loan from a bank to go and buy a rental or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we're, when we're buying subject to, we're not formally assuming the loan. So my name's not on the debt. Um, I'm not, um, you know, I'm just taking over payments on that lien. Okay. So the seller 100% understands that the, the mortgage remains in place after closing. There's a transfer of title to me or my buyer. And, um, but we have ownership position. So you mentioned the clouded title. Um, it, you said that everyone or just about every single uh, type of transaction is going to have a clouded title. So what is it about that that doesn't really concern you about this kind of transaction? Yeah, so kind of two different scenarios. I mean, let's say that, that a property is worth a couple hundred grand and we can buy it for a hundred and a hundred is owed on the property whenever we're going to buy it, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I would rather take over that $100,000 mortgage position and leave it in my seller's name versus me personally having to go and get a bank loan. Number one, the bank loan is going to be more expensive. It's going to take more time. Um, and you know, I, I personally don't want to go out and guarantee a bunch of debt and guarantee payments all over the place. Right. And so, um, and my business has zero dollars in bank financing. And a big reason for that is the builder developer that I worked for in 2006 ended up going bankrupt in 09 because the bank called his loan, even though he'd never missed a payment. You know, and a lot of commercial paper uh, is done that way where it's one year renewable. And so I just didn't want to build a business on that, right? And so um, I would personally rather not guarantee bank debt. And I also don't want to be in a position where, um, you know, we're having to go and, and create financing, borrow money all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's just a lot faster, a lot easier for us to take over payments on what's existing. So. Guys, I, I hope you're understanding the, the beauty of this because this is something that I'm currently getting into and the, the whole magic of this is just the fact that you've got someone and, and just like what you said, Brad, someone that has little to no equity in the house, if they go to sell it on the MLS, they're probably going to lose money. Um, and then even if they sell it to a, um, an investor like yourself, there's going to be transaction fees um, and, and there's a lot of headache that just comes along with it. This is just a very simple, hey, Brad's name is now going on title. I'm taking title and the loan is still there, but now I'm paying the loan. I'm speaking as Brad, by the way, <laughs> I'm paying the loan and it's, I mean, you wipe your hands clean. Now, Brad, here's, here's a question a seller might ask. Um, what if Brad doesn't pay the loan? What happens? Well, almost all the time, whenever I'm talking to my seller, and we have script work for all of this, I'm going to go ahead and tell them, look, I buy and sell houses. I don't buy and hold. So I'm going to market to put my buyer in place. 
So in most of the situations when we do these transactions, I actually never own the property and I'm never personally closing on the property. But um, you know, with everything, there's a disclaimer. So I'm often with a, a cup of coffee. So I'll say, look, you know, with everything today, there's a disclaimer. So it says caution, coffee hot as if we don't know. So a question that we get is, well, what happens if that buyer stops making payments? So what's always happened in the past is the buyer stops making payments. We continue to make those payments and we just repossess the house from that buyer. The person in your situation never knew that there was an issue. Now, with everything, there's a disclaimer. So my disclaimer is this, that if Great Depression number two happens, or if World War II, three happens, or something happens, and I get 160 houses back in one month, I can handle it for a while, but I don't guarantee that you don't get a call from me saying, hey, I've had to repossess a lot of property. If you wanna protect your credit, you're gonna to have to make a few months payments. That could happen. I don't think it's gonna happen, but it could. Mm -hmm. So it's just basically never saying never. Gotcha. Okay. So you're very upfront and clear with these, these uh, sellers as well. So you, you already kind of hinted towards what you're doing as the exit strategy, but you get a house subject to, and then what are you doing from there? Yeah. So depending on the property, because we, we still retail out at times, about 25% of our transactions, we're still retailing out of transactions. Uh, meaning we're putting it on the MLS with a realtor and cashing out. But 75% uh, of my transactions are selling with owner financing. And so really I look at real estate as being a means to an end. I'm not in love with houses. There are houses that smell bad, they break. Uh, I just had a house where uh, now I have two halves of a house because a tree like basically segmented my house in two. A uh, tree fell through the, the roof system and the second floor uh, subfloor. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to create mortgage notes. So what we're doing is we're creating a down payment that's often much better than a wholesale fee. We're creating a note for the future, which I look at as retirement money. And we're creating cash flow each month, which you being a cash flow guy, you know how important that is. Yes. You know, and oft, oftentimes we're doing this on transactions that a wholesaler could wholesale anyway. So it, it's a really nice, satisfying way to do a deal. Absolutely. So how long are the notes usually that you're doing? So we're writing 30-year paper. So we're creating 30-year notes. Now, uh, in general, your notes are either going to default or pay off in five years. Right. Okay. Got it. So in other words, you're getting rid of these houses after five years? Well, we're, I would say we're getting rid of the note because we don't okay. own that anymore, you know, uh, but we're generally getting a payoff or the buyer's going to default in five years. Okay. Got it. Now, as an owner financing, do you continue to get tax advantages? Well, we get tax advantages in the fact that we, we now have a long-term capital asset. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking a short-term capital gain and basically paying ordinary rates at that, uh, we have a note that's a long-term capital asset instead. Okay, got it. Are, are you usually rehabbing these properties in between, finding that? Yeah. Nope. Okay. And, and this time of year, so guys, we're recording in May, but this time of year, I, I kind of detest because we generally don't cut the grass either. So we start to get the the city summons to like, Hey, you need to cut the grass sort of thing. But I mean, almost every time when we're selling with, with owner financing, because there's such a big buyer pool that needs owner financing and there's so little supply, it doesn't take us long to move houses. So um, in general, the, the answer is no, we're not going to fix houses. We're not even going to cut the grass. Okay. Got it. So even if it needs some work that that buyer needs to be someone that says, Hey, I'm going to put some sweat equity into this and I'm going to come in and I'm going to fix it up myself if they want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the best example I have of that, I bought a house for $2,000 and sold it for 25 with owner financing. And um, the, on the marketing that we put out, the house was so bad uh, and it hadn't had a roof in God only knows how long, but we put on the marketing, if it's raining today, you need to take your umbrella inside the house because you're going to need it. And so we sold that house with owner financing. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't even imagine someone wanting to, to pick that up unless they're an investor. So that's, that's great. Um, what, what questions am I not asking, Brad? What are things that people need to know about this? You know, I think that um, it's always good to, to look at kind of the, the negative side of things as well. So I love mortgage notes. I, I think notes are sexy. Uh, the idea of controlling property and not having vacancy and repair is, is super exciting to me. And, and I just love the transaction, you know, like I don't love real estate, but I love people and I love transactions. But um, looking at the negative side of the business, um, I'm often asked, well, what's the bad side of notes, the bad side of notes. So I, I think it's um, really the main reason that people don't like notes 
is that they don't feel real. Okay. You know, so um, if you have a rental property and I've got, I've got a handful of rentals, I may have 10 units or so, but if you have rental property, you can go and touch it. You can see it, you know, it feels real. But if you, if you own mortgage paper, you, you basically own a file cabinet. So go into a file cabinet. There's not a whole lot to look at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've literally had people tell apprentices of mine, like, hey, you know, you shouldn't do that because you don't own anything. And, and, I, and this actually, a, a, one of my apprentices has a best friend in Atlanta. And I told him, well, go to downtown Atlanta and tell him to look up because I'm pretty sure that the tallest building is not a rental company or a construction company, but it's probably a finance company. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're into. Like we're in, interested in interest income and owning mortgage paper. But I think that the main thing that people don't like about notes, it doesn't feel real. Right. So, and the reason I asked about tax advantages is because if you were to lease option these, uh, you would essentially own it and have the tax advantages. So how, how come uh, owner financing instead of lease option? That's a really great question. I'm glad you asked. So a couple of things, whenever you sell with a lease option and I can see it to a, a better extent in, in a judicial foreclosure state where it takes longer to foreclose, but a couple of things, whenever you, you sell on a lease option, you still have a tenant and they know that they don't own the property yet. Okay, so a lot of tenant, um, tenant buyers, they, they sign an agreement that says, oh, well, I'll take care of any repairs. Well, they don't own the property. You can't contract away liability in almost every state. I mean, that's a, a very common legal doctrine. And so um, you're gonna have more repairs to do after that tenant leaves, that's number one. Number two, you don't get as good of a down payment because they, again, know that they don't own the property yet. We get big down payments on owner financing. So our cash up front is a lot better. Number three, I'm not interested in getting the property back. I'm interested in payoffs on notes. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you have a tenant buyer, it's really diff it's more difficult for them to get financing to, to as a purchase loan, as opposed to get a refinance because we've already financed the buyer. They're just getting a refinance. So we're going to be able to, to get paid off much sooner. And so my model is just different. I don't want boomerang houses coming back all the time. We want payoffs. We want the cash to come back in so we can go back out and reinvest. Okay, cool. And I, I guess I should have prefaced this for the audience, but guys, just so you know, the, the difference between what Brad is talking about with owner financing is that these buyers right away own the house versus Correct. a lease option. They're right away, yeah, they're putting down a down payment and they're paying a premium on the rent in order to have the option after that note is done of actually purchasing the house and then it becomes theirs. So that's the only difference there. Um, essentially almost the same process looks the same. It just is a different in a difference in terms of just like what you said, Brad, uh, having an asset versus having a note. So, um, that this is great stuff, man. And I guess the big thing here that we're talking about is, you know, especially right now, risk and mitigating risk. And this is something that as I see it, if I'm listening for the first time, now I'm suddenly saying, wow, I don't have to go out and raise money and wonder, hey, is the market going to drop? And am I going to be able to pay back the lender during the time in which we have this note together? So have you, is, is that the reason that you got into this type of exit strategy? Well, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think the reason that I got into it in the first place is because in 2010, it was the only strategy that I could find that worked. Mm. So I, I do think that the owner finance model works better during bad times. And are we going into bad times? I don't know. I think we're going into to maybe unstable times because nobody really knows what's coming. It's like unemployment's 30 million. Uh, one in 14 houses are behind on payments right now, which is a staggering number. Right. But you know, at the end of the day, when we're offering a house with owner financing, we're serving the most underserved buyer pool in the country because, you know, so in my market in Nashville, Tennessee, the last time I looked, there were 27 house, 2,700 houses on the retail market on the MLS. Well, I think you would be tough pressed to find five offered with owner financing. And so there's a big disparity in the demand supply curve uh, for those properties. And so um, I just found that it's the only thing that worked for me in 2010 and it's, it's never stopped working. That's awesome. So good. Um, so anything else that people need to know about this before we uh, kind of log off here and, and uh, send people to any resources that you have? So I'll talk in kind of general terms of mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and, and the real estate business. Guys, the, the real estate business is an amazing business. And I, I've often said if housing ceases to exist, I don't know what I would do. Because I think that real estate gives people 
really the best chance of, of financial freedom of any other asset class, you know? Um, and it, it's an asset class that I think I picked in part because I didn't know that I would be successful in anything else. I thought I had the highest chance here. So I, I, I decided to pick where it, it might be the easiest, but it all starts with commitment and determination. So nothing worth doing is easy. And if you're struggling right now, realize that there's a way through it. I think that this business can change lives. I've seen it many, many times. So uh, if you're having a tough time, realize that most people go through the struggle before they hit success. And that's a, a good thing. So uh, stay in the business, keep to your commitment, keep determined, and you'll be successful here. Yep. Especially even if there is any sort of change in the market, we can make money no matter where the market's Absolutely. at. And, Absolutely. Uh, that's great advice, man. Okay. So if people are loving what you're saying, you've got a podcast, you've got some ways to get connected as well. So can you just give a, a little rundown of how people can get connected with you? Yeah, totally. So if you're interested more in the owner finance model, then check me out at Investor Creator on iTunes, Stitcher, the various other podcast platforms. You can also, uh, I have my personal email address. You guys can email me, brad at bradsmotherman.com. Perfect. All right. Any last words? You've already said a lot and it's been really good stuff, man. I'm really excited for what people are hearing right now, but anything else before we log off? Man, I, I, I'm just, I have no idea. I, I think I'm exhausted after getting so excited about this real estate business. I'm going to just have to take a nap after this. <laughs> uh, you and me both, man. All right. Hey, thanks, Brad. I appreciate you being on and helping our audience to conquer the world of investing. Kyle, thanks for having me. Show notes for this one, fearlesskyle.com forward slash Brad. And again, just go check out his podcast, The Investor Creator. Great one out there. A lot of real estate investing podcasts out there. I think Brad's is one of the better ones. Um, I'm going to be on the show as well, so maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I definitely think that Brad's is one you should go check out and just continue to uh, learn how you can get into this low-risk way of getting into real estate. That's exactly what I'm doing, a couple partners and I are doing. We really see the opportunity here right now with subject to lease option, owner financing. There's so many different great ways to be able to get into it right now. And I would say that is exactly what you should be doing too, is looking at ways to get in with little to no risk. So let's go ahead and get you over there. Once again, fearlesskyle.com forward slash Brad, and it will show you how to conquer the world of investing. We'll see you next time.